A new Australian film is uh, screening at Acme from March 10th to the 20th, a film called Friends and Strangers. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the writer, producer, director of Friends and Strangers, James Vaughan. James, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thanks for having me, Peter. It's great to be here. And it's good to talk to you because I was so intrigued and impressed by this film uh, because uh, it's about these two young people, they're drifting, they're not sure where they fit in, in and so on. And they arrive in Sydney and we get this idea that they are trying to find themselves, in particular, the, the, the male of the two. And we hear such interesting dialogue and it's about history, about culture, about art. We learn a lot about history and about Australia and where they fit in. How did it all come about, James, that you uh, put this first feature film together? Thanks for the intro. Um, yeah, it was a very long and slow process. I kind of knew that I wanted to make the film before I knew what the film was. I just knew I wanted to make a film. Um, and my writing process is a little back to front in that I don't really start with a story or, or a narrative start to finish. It's, it's more um, a collecting process of fragments and maybe, maybe written scenes or just ideas for interactions or situations that start to kind of collage into a bit of a, yeah, like online notes kind of thing that I'm just like thinking about. Um, consciously or, or, or when I'm not thinking about it, you know, just starting to order some, some of these things. So I started that process around the same time I started fun, trying to, you know, save money to fund the film. And I knew both of those processes were going to take years. So there was a fairly unhurried way that it began. Um, and the script just took shape kind of organically as we got a bit closer to the, the budget, the target budget as well. Um, but it was very much influenced in what you mentioned that, that it's kind of about these two characters, but also about Australia generally, I, I guess I saw, yeah, in the one, in the one hand, on the one hand, I was very much inspired by the kind of social environment I was in at the time um, with a lot of people in their mid twenties, a little bit lost and working in cultural spaces and institutions, but not really knowing at, at a, in the kind of entry level position, but not really knowing where it was, going to go to or if they'd have to change tack completely and um you know retrain as a as a as a lawyer or something so yeah it was just this sense of being a bit lost um for people that have had maybe had quite a lot of confidence in themselves as people who were going to go and become artists or something um you know writers or, or anything like that in the early 20s and that's starting to 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 disappear that confidence started to disappear a little bit um so there was that on the one hand, and then I guess I, I felt like there was some energetic parallels with some aspects of Australian culture, contemporary culture too, in that we, we do sort of seem trapped in this adolescence culturally, um, not, not quite confident enough to really, yeah, I mean, just looking at, at our history, sort of telling, telling fairy tales about, I guess, where the important dates in the history of this land and, and where we've we've come from and, and where we're going, it just seems all quite politically sanitized. Um, you know, when you look at our national holidays and our difficulty moving past even changing the date from the beginning of colonization and Anzac Day and these these things that, yeah, they're just odd, odd in some ways to me um, as markers of our, our national identity. So it was, it was thinking, I suppose, about how those two parallel strands could maybe reverberate off each other, other a little bit. And um, yeah, so it's a slow, slow process, I suppose, of getting the balance right, because having too much, you, I didn't want it ever to be didactic or anything. So um, having those things as like hints through, throughout. Well, I, I found the uh, such uh, astute observations uh, as the film progresses and, uh, and the commentary and dialogue that is most unusual, I suppose, for a, a typical, if you like to, call that Australian film, uh, which, which really sets this one apart. Tell me about uh, the, the, uh, the script. Was it fully formed when you were shooting or did you allow improvisation? Because I felt at times that there was some uh, uh, extemporization and uh, improvisation going on. Yeah, I would say we, we definitely went into the shoot 
with a script that was very much locked off. Um, and there were a few reasons for that. There's a lot of non-professionals that were involved. And I think for them, um, the idea of in, you know improvisation, uh, I think is a bit stressful for, for, for people who haven't done it before. It, it's it's like, okay, I can, I can do this and try and speak naturally as long as you just tell me what to say. Um, so for probably 98% of the film, it's pretty much yeah, just going straight off the script. But there are a few characters or, or, or performers who are particularly good with improv. improv um, and that's Greg, Greg Zimbalist is probably one in the, from the, the father in the, the scene in the house towards the end. Um, and it, there weren't big, really big, big changes, but he's just very good at sprinkling your swear words and, and just other kind of, um, yeah, the padding that we put in our sentences. He's very good at filling, filling lines out to make them sound just like they are just coming off the top of his head. Um, but most of the performers, I would say, stuck pretty closely to the script. And yeah, so there was that, that the reason for that, make, make it, I think it made people a bit more comfortable. Um, but also with working with Dimitri, the cinematographer, he had quite clear plans around time of day for, for lighting and, and for setting up particular shots in particular directions to, to time with the angle of the sun and all that kind of thing. And um, having the scripts pretty much locked off meant that we could plan, okay, like for this part of the scene, we're gonna be facing them there. And that meant Dimitri could then with the first AD plan time of day stuff. So sticking to that was also important for our schedule and for getting the, the look of the, the film too. So, yeah. Oh, well done on that. Cause uh, yeah, I'm very impressed then because uh, the uh, the dialogue is incredibly uh, strong and uh, and uh, interesting. And uh, I really enjoyed, enjoyed that. So tell me about casting your two central people, uh, Fergus Wilson and Emma Diaz, because they, uh, I don't think I've seen them in, in much before, but they seemed so natural in the way that they were able to relate to one another, uh, talk, uh, your dialogue, et cetera, and, and for the journey that they had from Brisbane to Sydney and then in Sydney. Uh, tell me about casting them and how you worked with them. They both were cast very late on. Um, it was probably less than three weeks, maybe even closer to two weeks before we were scheduled to start shooting that, that we locked them in. And they were, it was just luck in both cases, actually. I wrote the two parts for other people who um, one decided you know, probably after the script was pretty much done, but like well before pre-production that she wasn't interested anymore in, in doing it. Um, and the other was, and she was an actor, and the other was um, a, yeah, based on someone who I knew in Melbourne, who I used to live with actually. And he was really keen when I had the idea, but by the time we got around to being getting close to shooting, he'd moved to New Zealand with his partner and was just in a different phase of life and wasn't, yeah, the, the chaos of kind of coming and probably sleeping in someone's floor for three weeks and shooting this film and not, you know, we weren't being, we didn't have enough money to pay the actors. We paid most of the crew, but the actors were, were working for nothing too. So he was just, it was just a wrong, wrong time for him. Um, and so, yeah, that, but he pulled out quite late so that it, the pressure was really on with the, the casting and I, probably a bit naive about how I thinking that the right person would just turn up and in the end they did but it, it came too far too close for comfort um Emma's it just just came through an acting call out like a call out for actors and she's an, an actor as well and in her case she just yeah with the the audition it was just clear straight away she got the naturalism and I think other yeah some other people were it was a bit more theatrical and I just knew that that really wasn't going to work for this film and for this this dialogue um she played it quite straight and and without too much um yeah like not trying to trying to load emotion into or, or psychological interpretation into different lines too much just just kind of playing it pretty flat and i think yeah it, it adds i knew that was going to work for her character because you i i knew that it would be good if you didn't quite know what she was thinking or where she was coming from and, and same for him too i just thought for their relationship which is yeah, in his zone of uncertainty that that was going to be good too, because not only do we not know, but there's an element of them not knowing really what what, what they're doing there and, and what they want from the situation. So yeah, Emma just got that intuitively. Um, 
And Fergus was someone who I got involved to actually help shoot the auditions. He, he was the videographer um, that was shooting the stuff and we just weren't finding anyone right for the main character. And it was the end of the day and we had a bit of extra time and it was kind of just a joke suggestion that Fergus reads some of the lines before we leave um, as just something to do. And as soon as he started, it was just so obvious. I was like, how did I, you know, you've been sitting here next to me <laughs> um, for days and it just did not occur to me once. And um, yeah, it took a bit of convincing cause he, it wasn't something he'd been planning on. You know, he had a uni course he was about to start and had to defer. And, um, but yeah, he, it took him a few days, but then he agreed to do it. And as soon as, as soon as we'd done that in audition with him, I knew he like, if he didn't do it, we were in, we'd maybe have to postpone the whole shoot because there was just no one else had been close. So I was really happy when, yeah, Fergus came on. And again, just intuitively seemed to get the, um, yeah, just the, the ordinariness of, of the delivery that was required and not trying to create a big character because the flatness would actually be an asset for that character. Yes, absolutely, and that works so well. Well, congratulations on that, because casting is uh, such a key element uh, of any film, and uh, and they both uh, are really very good. I know that uh, you have a background in editing, uh, and I'll, I might come back to that a bit more, because you've made some short films and, and so on. But I read that you had uh, quite a time editing this film, um, because you, I think you made some decisions about changes or removing scenes or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, the editing was, you sort of always know it's a bit of a gamble because it's the conventional wisdom is that you should, you shouldn't, you know, edit your own things. And it's just great to have that um, extra pair of eyes when you're starting to go a bit crazy with a project that's been going on for so long. And I was, um, and I knew that I, before I started, I knew that it was going to end that way. Um, but I just love editing and really, wanted to do it and kind of committed to that mentally knowing that there would be ups and downs and um through covid when yeah when that started i guess it was like an extra six months where there really nothing was ha happening in, in the world and the start of that process i thought the film was finished but it wasn't really it was just that that danger as an editor that you get bored of the whole project and just want it to be done so i was telling myself that yeah it was finished um but then that six months was, yeah, a, a really necessary amount of time to, to sit away from it and, and try some other things. And um, yeah, what came out of that was kind of a huge, huge change to the film, cutting about 25, 30 minutes off, off its length um, with this dream sequence section that was kind of completely, um, yeah, self-contained and, and, and sort of separate from the rest of the film and stranger. Um, and I, yeah, I really liked that at strip stage. And it was, it was so hard to shoot too. And it had been such a big part of the whole process that we just hadn't occurred to anyone to, to remove it. Um, and it's funny, like that, that they're, they're the sorts of traps that I think an, an, a, a, you know, a, a, an editor who's not the director can sometimes come in with those perspectives, but because we, had all just been yeah there for the shooting of it and the writing and it just felt oh no that has to, has to be there because it's always been there um it's actually danny fairfax um michelle's michelle former artistic director of myth michelle carey her, her partner who had the idea when uh i was showing it to a few people and trying to trying to show it to some people that hadn't seen it and, and danny hadn't had much contact or any contact with the film since he'd seen the script so he, he was coming in really fresh and when he suggested removing it, I just thought it was a joke because it was it was such a, I just couldn't think of the film without it, but couldn't get rid of that thought. And um, yeah, once it was taken out, the whole film just seemed to work better. We didn't lose much thematically and just felt lighter. And um, yeah, that, that that was something that I can't really take, take credit for as an editor because it was, yeah, I guess evidence of some of the dangers of editing yourself is that you don't see things like that. But um in the end yeah we got it into a into into a shape that everyone's happy with so i'll, t I'll happily take credit for some of that <laughs> okay well the film flows really well so tell me about locations because uh there's some interesting houses and locations that you used and also shooting in a car which is always 
fraught with issues and the use of mm. music. So, yeah, tell me all about that. Uh, the locations were another one um, similar to the, 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 the writing for kind of real people. I, I knew a lot of the, the writing was done for location, specific locations. Um, whether I was conscious of, the, of that or not, um, and the house is an example of one that I was kind of unconsciously thinking of when I was writing um, because I had visited that house in the film quite randomly, like a friend of a friend was an artist that the owner of the house you know, had bought work from and there was like a little part, like very intimate sort of gathering. And I just don't, socially it was a bit inappropriate for me being there, but anyway, I was there and the house made, <clears throat> made a big impact on me. And I just didn't realize that I really was actually dependent on, on that house particularly because I'd written the scenes for sp specific geography of the house, you know, the, the conversations up through the window and, and the, the multi-level kind of stuff. Um, so we started looking for other houses and A, they were just so expensive, you know, renting a house like that, you could be spending like $40,000 for three days. It's just stuff, money we didn't have. Um, and yeah, it, it, the, and B, they just weren't quite right. The, yeah, the architecture and, you know, there just was something that was like, oh, that's not how I imagined it. And so I ended up just asking um, the owner of this house and she was really supportive. I was surprised. I expected her to say no. And she just straight, said yes straight away. And um, we were, yeah, we shot there for four days. Um, and that house just, I mean, was just captured, I guess, everything I wanted that part of the film to capture in terms of the proximity to the water and that like elite, elite, elite layer of, of Sydney. Um, so that, yeah, that, that's one, I guess, example of that, that kind of preloading, having the environment almost like an, an, the, the location work, some of that being done while in, in combination and in relationship with the writing. Um, I do sort of just feel like I need a concrete place to think about scenes. Uh, and I find it just ends up, yeah, it ends up creating more opportunities for thinking about perspectives and, and, and things through windows or, or, you know, where characters are separated by physical spaces and the actual particulars of the location, adding something to, to scenes. Um, Nielsen Park was another one it was written for, Nielsen Park. Um, and yeah, Baranjak, it was, that was the, the camping location. That was also, I had another place in Queensland in mind. I really wanted to shoot there, but it was just gonna be impossible getting the crew way, way, way. It was like far North Queensland. Um, so then the, the quest was like to try and find something as similar as possible to that and was really happy with the place we ended up finding near Yass um, in, yeah, across the ACT, Baranjak. Very good, very good. And shooting in a car is always, can always yes. be problematic. Tell me about uh, the process there. Yes, and that's another scene that was written for that particular stretch of road. Um, and I knew that area very well because I live very close to there, which is, I guess, part of why I thought it, yeah, just would be a good, a good little, and, and it's quite recognisable too that 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 stretch of Oxford Street. Um, and I like the film having this quite clear relationship to particular parts of Sydney. And um, but yeah, that 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 scene was hard because we were trying to keep the integ spatial integrity, I guess, of the street in intact, not wanting to be cutting you know, in a way that people go, oh, that they were there and then they were there. And that's, um, yeah, or, or, or even that it looks like that the, they're not staying on the, on the one street. I really want it to feel like you're, yeah, almost documentary, you're in the car with them. And as, as they're cutting back and forth, it's moving in a way that's true to where that car would actually be moving. So I'm really proud of that scene because we did manage to cut it like that, but it was like really fine. You know, sometimes the performance just wasn't right in a, you know, if there'd been one take would have been different, there just would have been a huge hole and I would have had to use something to have broken that. But the way, yeah, just got quite lucky with the coverage we did, we did have. It was really hard because for sound reasons, we couldn't have the air con on and it was a really hot day. Um, for sound reasons also, we had to have the windows up, you know, to block out some of that street noise. So for every take, they had no air con windows up on a really hot day and just kind of like so sweaty and grumpy, you know, by, by the end of it. Cause it's also driving down in, in the city is stressful enough, but when you've got a camera crew around you and trying to remember lines and everything, it was just, 
yeah, they, they put in a huge shift that day, the actors. Um, but they, that's the hard side of it. But there's also something, I don't know, there's something easy too about shooting in a car because you get this free, this environment that's that's through the windscreen. And um, yeah, it's like a, a magical sort of lens into the world and you don't have to design any of that or put any of that in place. It's all being done for you. So there's that element of... Um, yeah, things come into life in a, in a car that is spontaneous and, and adds, but you don't have, it's not as stressful or difficult maybe to set up in that, in that way. Mm -hmm. How interesting, uh, the glamour of filmmaking. You never, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, terrific. I, I'm so interested in, in your process. And the use of music, and, I mean, you've mentioned cinematography and the film looks great, of course, uh, and, and really well shot, but uh, use of music and so on is also, uh, quite uh, relevant to the uh, the whole texture, if you like, of the film. Mm. Yeah, originally I thought there would be no music except for the music that was in, you know, physically in the, the diegetic music. Yeah. Um, and then it just seemed to work in the edit when I was adding music in a few different places, um, punctuating scenes and sections of the film a little bit. And for a film that is so yeah, told in these, these fragments that don't have a huge amount of narrative weight on their own um, to maybe make some of the, yeah, some of the connections between the themes and to, to, I don't know, just lift you up as a viewer from the, from how kind of prosaic, you know, everything is just to suggest perhaps that there's some, something else, you know, going on here thematically rather than it just being like very much about these, just what you're seeing. Um, so the music, the flute music, I think uh, had a role to play with that, like a kind of mysterious, um, a mysterious otherworldly kind of quality um, that just, yeah, it just seemed to to work. It gave, gave, confirmed perhaps some of the strangeness or uncanniness of a few things and just kind of confirmed that if that's how things were looking and you were confused that that, that is what the film is sort of about and, and driving at and trying to um, capture. So yeah, it helped for, for some of the reasons that I often don't like film being used, uh, sorry, music being used in film is that, yeah, it can just confirm or suggest a state of mind or mood. And sometimes I find that just a bit lazy, which is why I didn't want it, but it, it worked and tried to not overdo it. Um, the, so it's really just that flute music that appears a couple of times. Um, the music coming over from next door in that, that goes for about 20 minutes, which is twi more than twice what we originally thought. We thought it would go for like half that scene. And um, yeah, when they came back in and that music had gone off, um, I don't know, it was just flat after that. You, the scene, the, the rest of it couldn't really recover. It was great while it was there. So just, it added, it ended, I thought I was worried it'd be overkill, but it just, the rapid, like how long it goes on ends up kind of strengthening the whole thing and we didn't seem to lose anything. So that, yeah, there's a lot of music in that, in that section, but it's all with this kind of flimsy, you know, excuse in the, in the script to have what the sound designer called trans, trans diegetic music, where it was a term I, I had, wasn't familiar with. Um, but yeah, something that is, that sort of floats between being true to and of the, the space space of the film and something that is you know over over the top um, from the filmmakers clearly being added sort of floats between um, and yeah then there's it, the film's book ended by this this um, kind of old fashioned music that the, both of them are actually taken from silent film soundtracks and um, part of that was just that I was watching a lot of silent films and was really enjoying some of the music not all of it because often the the accompaniments are awful, but when you find good ones, yeah, it, it, I was really enjoying some of that. And I don't know when I when I just tried tried that, it it worked. Um, and I think helped helped some in some ways frame the film around this like colonial. There's something about the silent film. Uh, I think does yeah instantly take you to a different historical time, which I think the the film was trying to drive at that anyway, trying to locate Sydney in the present, but also see it in, you know, in, in the context of its own history. So something about the silent film helped frame that too, I think, yeah.
Yes, yes, exactly. And of course, when you're talking about silent film, which of course doesn't have any any sounds, this this is music that would be composed on subsequent releases of those films, I suppose. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So contemporary composers. Um, yeah. We were really lucky with Criterion owned um, one of them, and um, BFI owned the other, and they were both just so. I don't think they'd ever had this kind of request before to use film music that had already been commissioned and released and re reuse it. So there was no real legal, they, they didn't really even know what to charge. They were like, oh, I guess you can have it for a thousand dollars. And um, I think one of them still hasn't sent us the bill, you know, it just isn't in, in their structure for like, making money, I guess. They just never, yeah, never expected anyone to ask them that. So we were really lucky that they said yes. And, and they could have, or they, I, I thought they, if they were said yes, then it was never going to be for too much money. I was just worried that they, on some legal thing, just would, would say no, that we we um, we can't. It's been used in film, so. But they were, yeah, both really cool about that. Um, yeah. Well done on that. That's a, <laughs> again so a, a very interesting process that I, I hadn't heard too much about. So that's great. Now I know the film screened at Rotterdam. And I'm so intrigued, and, and of course it's screened uh, other places, and it's uh, it's getting quite a, quite a reaction. I, I remember when I saw it uh, last year at the um, um, at the actor judging screenings. Um, I thought, boy, this film really stands out. This this one uh, needs to be watched very carefully. And um, um, so, tell me about the reactions that you're getting to the film from Rotterdam to other sort of venues. Mm. Well, it was. It was a, a kind of a close thing about whether we had the film at Rotterdam because it was accepted by another major festival, um, but in a section of the festival that probably is not a main centerpiece section. So um, a festival that maybe on its own brings a little more, has a little, a little more clout in, within Australia um, just in terms of like industry, you know, what it means um, to when you're going for funding applications and things, something that just looks maybe for for the Australian, I, I'm not sure why, but I think overseas it's different. I think Rotterdam has more, has a higher place in, in the sort of thinking about things than it does in Australia. But yeah, it, it was a difficult decision and ended up going with Rotterdam mainly because of the Michelle Carey connection that she'd been, start, she started working there and she was really strongly advocating for it obviously that's her job but I, I do really have a lot of respect and um yeah a lot of respect for her and, and and trusted her when she said that this will position the film better for the kinds of people you want to want to see it um this section is looked at by the, exactly the sort of people that uh, are going to help this film thrive and she would just ended up being so right because at Rotterdam that hardly any people you know or like non-film professional people just a general audience people that the, the numbers were really low because it was in the middle of COVID lockdowns and I just don't think anyone was it was yeah I'm, I'm not sure what your experience was with with screeners through through the, the long period of festivals not really happening in person but me personally I just didn't get much enjoyment from online festivals and ended up skipping them and just thinking oh, I'll just wait till we're back in the cinemas um I'll wait to see this down the track, you know, when it, when an opportunity to see it in the cinema comes along. So I, I think a lot of people were feeling the same sort of thing. So the general audience experience and feedback wasn't something I really had the, the chance to have um, virtually or in person, which is a shame. But the amazing thing about Rotterdam was that, yeah, what Michelle said was was true and the right critics and, and people saw it. And I guess there was from early on, yeah, a good critical response that I just heard from critics that got in touch and were like, where, where did this film come from? It seems, it's a, yeah, it seems a bit um, out of out of rhythm with maybe the stuff that they were used to seeing coming out of Australia. Um, and I think the advocacy of some of those critics um, to other festivals and, and things that ended up being really important for set, setting the, I guess, the... I'm not sure what what it's called the critical sort of yeah basically just setting a um setting a i, I don't know I, I don't know how this stuff works because i'm not i'm not a critic but i think 
yeah. when when there's a consensus or something established early amongst critics that are friends, it does help when when the next person sees it and they've heard something good from a critic mm. that they they know a fellow critic. Um, obviously, everyone has their own views and things, but I think it just it did help cut through some of some of the prejudices probably about Australian films too is another another thing because um, it was the first Australian film in the Tiger competition and yeah it's gone to some festivals that Australian films aren't, aren't often at like John Ju and in, in Korea and um, new directors new films I know Baby Teeth was there uh, I think the year year or two before Friends and Strangers but in general not not so many Australian films there either um, and yeah it ended up meaning that the film was included on the sight and sound list, which is so great for us um, because it was a lot of those critics that, that's, that you know, submitted Friends and Strangers in their, in their top 10 were people that saw it originally at Rotterdam um, and then kept sort of advocating it to other festivals and, and things later. So um, yeah, I think through Rotterdam, John Ju happened, New Directors, New Films happened, um, the Viennale happened, um, which is another great festival that, for, for whatever reason, uh, yeah, Australians haven't targeted that much. And it, probably some of that comes down to just the pecking order that's set up in the industry here. But that was another one that, yeah, was, was really special to get into. And um, I can't, yeah, basically just can't overstate how important Rotterdam was in just setting the, the, the trajectory for the film. Oh, absolutely, yes. Rotterdam is, is regarded as a much more of a niche film festival where emerging directors and, and, uh, and filmmakers um, appear and, and uh, yes, well, well done on that, getting that recognition. In fact, it's interesting. I mean, it's a very Australian film in many respects, but as, as I was watching it, I also felt it had a, a European sort of slant to it, Eric Romare and those sorts of films that are very dialogue driven, but have something to say and, uh, uh, and have uh, uh, acute observations and ideas in them which, um, as I say, you don't often get in Australian films, but uh, you do get in European uh, cinema a, a lot of the time. So anyway, um, I think that's that's terrific to hear all that. I wanted to ask you, uh, James, um, as I mentioned, you're an editor as, uh, as well, a background. And I know Ted Wilson, I've met him a few times uh, with his film Under the Cover of Cloud uh, at, uh, at BOFA, and, and you were editor of, of his film. Yes, that's right, yeah. So that was something I was doing. I was really hesitant to commit to that because it was when I was in the writing, like late stages of writing and late stages of um, saving and starting to think about crewing and pre-production, even though it was still um, years away at that point, but I just started to think about, oh, I don't want to be over, over committing myself. Um, so it took me a long time to, to come on to that film. Um, even though Ted's a, a really close friend and I was, you know, really supportive of him doing it and everything and thought it sounded great, but just, yeah, it took me a while to come on, but then when I did, I was so, so glad I did. Um, I think the experience of editing that as the first feature, I'd, proper feature I'd edited did really help me, yeah, give me some more confidence that I could edit my film too. Um, that was, yeah, but the whole project was just such a, such a delight. And I, I really enjoyed that it was so different to what I was working on too. Um, you know, there's some similarities in terms of it being very much about these ordinary naturalistic kind of moments, but aesthetically and in terms of the performance and um, yeah, the, the way it was shot and, and everything, it was, it was really different. And that was just like a fun break from my own thinking about things. Um, and yeah, I just I had so much respect for what Ted was was trying to do. And again, like in, in an Australian context, a pretty different sort of film um, that perhaps, you, you know, you didn't say it, but could, could be said about Ted's film too, that has like quite a European um, influence perhaps in, yeah, in exactly what you said, that it's quite dialogue heavy and not really driven by narrative flashpoints, you know, and, and it's, hard to categorize in genre terms and um but yeah it's it's artistically about something it has something mm. to say on both a yeah micro and, and macro level about something about yeah life in australia there um that is I just found really poignant from the first contact i had with the production um and 
yeah, definitely uh, sort of has a literary, literary quality and it's kind of, um, I guess in its authorial perspective too, with the voiceover and the, the fiction within the fiction of, of the, the fake book that you don't know if it's real or, or, or not. And um, yeah, there was just so much to, to like about that film and I'm really proud of, proud of the work we, we did on that because that was another one that was really hard to uh, decide what would, what would stay in the film. There was like 14, 15 hours of usable material um, and the cuts went from about that long and you know down to six hours, five, four, three, two, and trying to work out what, yeah, what, what to keep took a long time as well. Um, but I love, yeah, those those journeys in the edit when sort of most of the hard work is done when you're not actually at the computer. It's like it just comes to you, you know, and you're an idea for structural change, and then you try it and watch it, and yeah, so it was a really really fun process. How very, very interesting to hear that. Okay, two final questions to conclude uh, the interview. Um, firstly, for you, James, are there particular films or filmmakers who perhaps may influence or, uh, or actors as guides for the way that you approach filmmaking? Yeah, um, there's a lot, and that probably ended up being influenced by different things from different filmmakers um and every every filmmaker has something or, or the great ones you know to me the ones that i really can be obsessed with over you know years and years and, and have different phases of, of interest and interest get interested in different things um there were yeah a spectrum of film filmmakers there who at first glance probably have no stylistic similarity to, to friends and strangers but um yeah maybe just in in some way of like a some approach to to filmmaking uh, or a spirit that is was something there that i always just admired um so maybe starting most recently hong sang su uh is a korean filmmaker and yeah he's just uh the way he works with like formally clever literary kind of comedies it just I just instantly fell in love with his his filmmaking from when I first discovered it about 10 or so years ago, um, partly because he was working with humour in a really interesting way that I just didn't see in the art house um, scene uh, that much, um, that a lot of films were very serious, you know, slow cinema and very serious mm -hmm. um, auteur films. And he was, yeah, making these much shorter films that were extremely playful and I, I just find very dry but to me so funny so he was someone who in I think I was very inspired by both his approach and also like what he's the, the characters and and the world he creates in his films because they are these fairly lost people often middle class Koreans who get trapped in these um little whirlpools of absurdity through you know their own making socially and um playing a lot with repetition and um and yeah there's something i love in his films that's like micro about these particular people but that it's also saying something very much about the, the absurdity of um so much of our social existence and, and performances and the 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 appearances people try and, and keep up and people's pettiness and all these things it's just um you know we all know about people but um yeah he 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 doesn't try and hide any of that and is really interested in in that those those foibles that seem to seem to reveal something deep about i guess us as animals um you know the, that are only partially uh partially adapted to this strange world where we've created for ourselves and um yeah so it was very inspired by by him by someone like miguel gomes um a picture pong we're ethical. Um, there's a filmmaker, Bruno Dumont, French filmmaker, I really, really love. Um, they're probably the, the ones from re more recently that I was really paying close attention to, to, to what they were doing and really excited, you know, when they had a new film coming out and um, just thought they were taking the medium in a really interesting direction. Um, and then going back, I guess, yeah, there's so many, Ozu, Brisson and Again, not not necessarily filmmakers that 
uh, it's easy to, yeah, see like how friends and strangers formerly is like um, either of those filmmakers, but it was more just, to, I just, yeah, Pasolini filmmakers from, from that earlier period that um, I just admired an approach or some certain kind of uncompromising um, and Rivette was another one. Um, yeah, like a, a, a spirit of experimentation and play and, um, and an approach to the form that I just found inspiring maybe more than what they're actually, like the, the techniques themselves. Okay, a really interesting collection of uh, influences there. That's, that's terrific. So just to conclude, uh, James, uh, are you working on another project at the moment? And, and just to add to that, at the back of my mind, I'm wondering if you're going to do a sequel to Friends and Strangers, because I'd love to know what's going to happen to these two people. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I did always have that uh, in mind, that that's, that was happening. Um, a sequel and maybe like many sequels because it's the structure of the film where we meet people and they cross over briefly in each other's lives it, it would could as a model easily i think extend mm. outwards and just keep going and picking up various random strands and having these i mean the, the longer it goes on the more complicated it gets with trying to make it all make sense and fit together um and that was probably part of why I ended up like drifting away from it too. Um, was yeah, just just the the real world complications that come with that. Can we get this actor again? And you know, if if not, then it all starts to unravel. Or mm -hmm. does that person look too different now? And um, so I moved away from the idea of a sequel. But um, yeah, I've got a kind of similar. Actually, the part that we cut out of the film, um, which I really loved on its own, it just wasn't working. Sort of using that as a starting point for the next film. Um, so it's set in the in the bush. It's like some hike people going hiking who have a kind of random encounter at the start, and then it just kind of enters this dream dream zone and um, pushes into a little bit of of horror, but in a in a not typical Australian horror film way, I guess. Um, yeah, political staffers and sort of, in, you know, wizard, maybe fantasy elements. It's quite, the draft I've got is quite bonkers at the moment, but um, we'll see, yeah, if it gets more, <laughs> if those crazy elements disappear as I have time away from it and come back, or if I'll just add, keep adding more craziness, we'll, we'll see, I'm not, Far enough through to know where that's going to land yet, but okay. But I'm already intrigued. I'd, I'd be I'd be very interested to see what you make of all that. It's a, it should be a really interesting one. Look, um, it's been my pleasure to speak to writer, director, producer James Vaughan, whose film Friends and Strangers is screening at Acme uh, from March 10th onwards until about 20th of March, maybe longer. And uh, I hope the film uh, succeeds for you, uh, James, it should, and that it thank attracts you. an audience because it deserves one. And uh, James, thanks so much for talking with me. Thanks, Peter. It's been awesome to chat. Thank you.